Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Pia and I am so happy that you're joining me here today for a little chat about yarn and knitting. Today I have a finished object that I can't show you. I have a whip that I have been carrying with me for 8,000 kilometers only to not touch it. And then I have four brand new cast-ons. But before we get into those, I just want to show you what I'm wearing. I am wearing my cat number two, the sweater that I designed during our second knit-a-thon. So it is a short sleeved sweater with this uh, lace and ripping up uh, around the shoulders. If you want to know more about this sweater, I actually suggest you go back and watch the previous episode where I talk more about it and where I also talk about how it used to be a beautiful, vibrant teal color, but yeah, somehow ended up in this sandy beige. I will say though, uh, as I predicted, I have almost forgotten about the beauty of the original teal color and I am very, very happy with this color. I think it's beautiful and it is, yeah, it's, it goes right into my wardrobe. This is a color that I am super comfortable with, so. But I did like the teal though. I will, of course, link the pattern in the description box below, together with everything else that I'm going to talk about during this episode. As I mentioned, I do have a finished object this week. I just can't show it to you because I forgot it. I left it back in Denmark. I am now in Texas. I'm a little bit upset about forgetting it because one, I really wanted to show it to you. And two, I really wanted to wear it. It is a beautiful little scarf, a test net that I did for Ina, the queen of scarves. Ina in this photo is actually wearing the new scarf. It's called Ines Sommerfugle or Ines Butterflies because the pattern going down the spine of the scarf resembles butterflies. It is such a beautiful pattern and it is a fun, quick knit, perfect sash buster. The one that I made, I picked out some, some of my own hand dyed yarn on a regular sock base, fingering weight sock base. I think I used a little more than 50 grams, something like that. So for all these little balls or half skeins you have laying around, well, you can make a beautiful scarf with them. I really love this scarf because it is shaped with some short rows, which means that it grows really fast width-wise, but it doesn't grow as much in height. Uh, I don't like the tiny scarves to be super skinny. Uh, that just makes me look a little silly. It's so cool on other people, but it's not for me. I like the bandana style scarves, but I don't like them to be too deep. Um, they, they're supposed to be scarves. And Ina is a master in, in shaping these little scarves. I of course had to cast on a new scarf since I forgot the original one at home. So I went to Joanne's uh, looking for the perfect yarn. I didn't really find the perfect yarn for a scarf. What I did find, however, was perfect yarn for a shawl. This is uh, a heavy DK worsted weight, something like that, acrylic yarn. And I don't know if, if it comes through on the camera. It, it looks a little bit like chenille. It is not a chenille yarn, but 
the structure of it and the lightness resembles a chenille yarn. So I got, I think, four balls of this. I cast on Ina's scarf and I do actually plan to allow this to grow into a shawl because that would just be so beautiful. Let me see if I'm able to show you this. Uh, <laughs> it is very much alive, but I think now you can you can see the beautiful pattern. That is the only pattern that it there is uh, on this scarf. So you just have a beautiful, very simple scarf with a little something on it. And as you can see, I mentioned it when I spoke about the finished scarf. It does grow very, very fast width-wise, but not nearly as fast uh, in height. And that is exactly how I like my scarves and currently also my shawls. Sometimes I really like a huge shawl to cuddle up in, but this, I'm, I'm thinking that this would be beautiful on sun-kissed skin, uh, a late summer night sitting out in the garden and maybe just being a little bit chilly. This is what I plan for this thing to become. But who knows, maybe I will get impatient and bind off long before that so that I can get my tiny scarf to protect me from the constant air con. I have a lot of whips. I did, as I also mentioned, carry my Ellsworth wrap all the way over here. I have not touched it, so I'm not going to show it. I am going to show, however, my new cast-ons. If you watched the previous episode, you heard that I more or less ran out of things to knit on. Um, and that was kind of scary. So as soon as I got back to Denmark, I cast on a summer top for myself. Um, this is my, I'm using the pattern for my Texas tee because my Texas tee is just this very simple raglan uh, that just, it has a great fit and it is an easy pattern. You can use a lot of different yarns for it because the gauge is 21 stitches to 10 centimeters or four inches. So a lot of yarn will will be good for that gauge. The original Texas tee was actually knit uh, using a, oh, was that a single? Yeah, a Merino singles uh, fingering weight, but that fluffed up beautifully and was perfect at that gauge. This is a heavier yarn. This is a DK weight yarn. The navy stripes, that is some drops, uh, cotton light. It's a cotton acrylic blend. I have had these, I think there were four or six skeins that I've been having in my stash forever and ever because there was not enough for a sweater uh, or a t-shirt. There was enough for a top, but would I wear a top? And also navy blue wasn't really my... Lots of excuses. <laughs> excuses. It was just hanging out in my stash. But then I decided to pair it with some white drops bell, this uh, cotton linen blend, to make a very summery t-shirt. My plan is to stop with the stripes now. So I will only have the stripes uh, on the up part of the body and then the lower part is going to be uh, plain white. I think often you see these sailor shirts that are plain white uh, on top of the yoke and then the striping starts and I decided that it could be fun to see how it would work out to just turn things around, have the stripes on top and the plain white. Uh, on the lower part of the body. But this is this is just a fun and easy knit. It's a pattern that I know very well and it, it's just 
so easy, so fast. I am using size six needles, which of course also helps the whole thing go relatively fast. But yeah, I actually really want to finish this one because I think it would be beautiful for the summer to wear with shorts and jeans on colder days. Yeah. I, I, Truly, I want to knit on this all the time, but then things happened because my plan was to knit on this one uh, and the, the scarf until they were both done. But then Father's Day came and then my we celebrate Father's Day on June 5th. I know that over here it's later, but yeah, since we're Danish, we're celebrating on the 5th. And Peter had been dropping hints. Um, he knows about knitting. He knows that he needs to drop the hints well, well in advance. And he had been doing that. He had been letting me know that it was about time that he got a new sweater, that it had been a year and a half since I last knit him a sweater. Uh, and I thought, hmm, I would like to knit him a sweater. It's quite the undertaking. Um, those of you who have watched the vlogs, uh, the hiking vlogs on some of my previous episodes, you will know that it takes a lot of stitches to cover all that man. But uh, yeah, for sure, he's getting a sweater. Uh, I made a panic order with Bettina from Anita's World. Oh, can you get me some yak silk uh, dyed up in your navy colorway. Uh, fast, like fast, fast. Uh, I think she delivered in two or three days. She must have been so busy. But isn't this just perfect? I chose the yak silk blend because Peter is kind of particular when it comes to his sweaters. He wants them super, super soft. He also wants them kind of warm. He wants a woolly expression. He would not care for a sweater worked up in a plant-based fiber. Uh, and add to that that he is quite hard wearing on his sweaters. I decided that yak and silk would be a perfect blend for him. Uh, the silk actually makes this very durable, and I have I have used this yarn before. I used it on my perfect little party gun and some other uh, things, and and there is absolutely no pulling, and it can take some beatings. Uh, Bettina dyed this up uh, using the dark gray uh, base, so the color is very very rich beautiful. Um, I think it is here. It's true to color. The color actually reminds me of a pair of jeans in a dark wash that has been just a little bit worn. So it has little um, flecks of lighter color. Maybe it's easier to see it when it is knit up. Can you see how it knit up, knits up? that you have this very dark navy blue color, but then the, the variations to the yarn, it is a semi-solid semi and the variations just makes me think about jeans that has been worn and loved and washed uh, a lot of times. I am making this up as I go. I am measuring it all the time, measuring him, putting it on him to make sure that it fits because I want this to be the perfect fit sweater for him because he's also kind. No. Wow, words. He is also quite particular with the fit of his sweaters. If a sweater doesn't fit him perfectly, he's just not going to wear it other than a few times just to make me happy. So uh, I am designing this as I go, making sure that it will fit him 
perfectly. Um, as you can see, I did not put in the neckline ribbing yet. Often when I knit sweaters for Peter or heavier sweaters for myself, I will wait and put the neckline in last because the whole fit of the sweater changes a lot. Um, of course, you can, you can tell a lot about the, the finished fit by trying on your yoke. But a sweater, a heavy sweater, will change the way the yoke fits. And if I had cast on um, using some kind of stretchy cast on to, to allow for his head to get through it and just continued on down, there would be a lot of pressure on that single cast on edge that would more or less have to carry the whole sweater. And there's a big risk that, that it would stretch uh, over time. So instead, I just cast on after the neckline, and then I'm going to work the neckline later when the sweater has grown uh, to proportions where I feel certain that, that I can put in the perfect neckline for him. I don't know which kind of neckline I'm going to put in, if it's just going to be a two by two ribbing. You can see I have uh, two stitches in the raglans here. So either just a regular two by two ribbing, uh, maybe a folded over neckline, maybe a funnel neck or something like that. I have to figure that out as the sweater grows and I see it on him. Um, but for now, I just have miles and miles of stockinette ahead of me, which I'm not mad about that. I love just knitting stockinette stitch in the round, and it's a beautiful yarn, and it's for someone that I really, really love. So I am quite happy about this project. I'm also happy that there is no deadline on it, because I do know that it's going to be kind of a slog to get through the body. But yeah, the things you do for love. And then, I mean, I'm not scared about the sweater curse. We've been together for 40 years, so I'm, I'm not afraid that he's going to leave me before the sweater is finished. So that was three new cast-ons. Then my daughter-in-law greeted me as we came over here to Texas saying, oh, I watched your video from the Maldives. That top you were wearing. Will you make one for me? And I cannot say no to her. And I was like, oh, please let it be something that's easy to work. And I went in and I rewatched it and I was wearing, look at my holes. The sweater that almost killed my elbow last time. And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. But it's a beautiful sweater for sure. And she really wanted it. So what I have done in an attempt to, to spare my elbow just a little bit is I ordered, and instead of working it in, uh, in the drop spell, the linen cotton blend that I did my own in. I ordered this um, cotton acrylic blend. It is 55% uh, cotton and 45% uh, acrylic. It, it has a lot more bounds and a lot more give than a 100% uh, cotton or a cotton linen blend would have. So that was the first thing that I changed. And then I also changed the stitch pattern just in a, in a tiny, tiny way. The, the way that you make the, the decreases, I changed those just a little bit to make them easier to execute. And I am happy to report that my elbow is still working. Uh, I do take it slow with this. Uh, I knit on it for a couple of hours and then I will change into something else just to rest my elbow. But yeah, it's, it's growing. 
I mean, another good thing is that she's a tiny person, so I'm knitting the third size, something like that, second or third size. So it's, it's not going to take me too long to finish it for her. And she's going to be so happy and she's going to look adorable in it. The yarn was something that I got uh, off of Amazon, but I am so pleased with how this is working up and, and with the feel and the touch of it. So I've actually ordered some more. I have uh, ordered some gray and some cream colored uh, because I know I will have at least one bowl of the black left and then I'm going to make myself another stripy summer top using these yarns. And this is a budget-friendly choice. I think I paid $14 for four skeins. So that's definitely, definitely recommend this yarn if you're okay with the uh, acrylic blends. It is a very nice summer yarn. I am sorry if I'm a little fiddly today, all the time moving around and whew, trying to move my hair around. Um, I did uh, go out to turn off the aircon because it was too noisy and too cold. And now it's, it's super hot in here. So please bear with me. I will try to make myself be just a little more calm in the heat. But for tips and tricks today, I thought that we could talk about stripes because I'm into stripes right now. Uh, my stripe Texas tee, my plans to make another stripe t-shirt. Um, I have what I think is a great tip for uh, working stripes. As we all know, I'm not very good at swatching. I don't do swatches. I mean, rarely do I ever swatch. And for sure, I'm not going to sit and knit a host of swatches to figure out how I want to place my stripes on a garment. So what I do is I take a piece of just regular uh, cardboard like this, and then I wrap my yarn around it to see how it works together. And of course, I shouldn't have picked a white piece because it's going to be difficult to see the white yarn. But I make a lot of these um, just to determine what ratio between the stripes I like. Uh, if I have multiple colors, I'm also going to uh, wrap them around to figure out how do they play together the best, the different yarns? This is such an easy way to make a swatch if you're going to be making a striped sweater. I started doing it when I made my first Scrappy Strieber, this one. It's all yarn that I bought over here um, in the McKinney Knittery, and I was really unsure how these different colors would would play together and what would be a nice sequence and so i was making these little tests just to see because often in a stripy pattern if, if i have multiple colors i will err on the side of being too cautious um, just letting everything melt together blend in together but actually there is a lot of power to just adding one crazy color to break the whole thing up much easier to do it here than to knit it into a swatch or even a sweater so i really recommend playing with stripes on just little pieces of cardboard of course, when you're working stripes, you also have the problem of the jog. It sounds like a title of a book or a movie. It should be. It's a huge problem. When you are knitting in the round, you are not 
knitting one round, going up to the next, knitting that, going up, like you actually often do in crochet. No, you're knitting in a spiral. Helical knitting, you know, that we, we do that to smooth out this jog um, from one round to the next. Um, if we just knit, if, if I had just been knitting with the white and then at the beginning of round changed into the navy, there would have been a jog. You would have been able to see where I changed my colors. And now I'm, hang on, I'm trying to find, here is my beginning of round. This is the one. There you go. My beginning of round. So here I changed the colors. And I actually think I did a pretty good job of avoiding the jog, the jog didn't I? I think I did. Um, I changed the color here just before the raglan stitch. And I actually think I did pretty good, if I do say so myself. It's very simple. What you do is you knit with, in this case, your white color. Then when you want to add your navy blue, you just add it and you knit a full round with the navy blue. When you have, when you are then starting round two, you take the first stitch on your left needle, the first stitch after your beginning of round. That stitch you have to work in a special way to avoid the jog. What you do is you take the stitch below the stitch on the needle, you put that stitch up on the needle and you knit the two stitches together. That really smooths things out. Of course it's not perfect and that is also why I am changing my color in the raglan seam rather than uh, on the back where my original uh, beginning of round was because it's going to be more noticeable if, if you do it uh, in uh, mid back. So I moved my beginning of round to the raglan seam and then I worked the first stitch on the second round of every new color by taking the stitch below it, putting it up on the left needle and knitting the two together. So super easy way to smooth out the jog. I'm not going to say avoid the jog because I don't think you can avoid it 100%, but you can smooth it out. News this week, I have published my cat number three, the vest that I worked on uh, during our third knit-a-thon. So it is out on Ravelry and in my own web shop now. It does come in eight different sizes and I do include some tips on how to choose a size for a vest because that can be a little bit tricky. I also include instructions on how to make the ties at the sides as the one I'm wearing in the photo and uh, how to put in buttons instead, which is actually what I usually do for my vests is I will add buttons, typically just one, to the back piece and then I'll just button the front onto that. But yeah, I do provide both instructions in the pattern and it is, as I said, available on Ravelry in my web shop and I will link it in the description box below. When I'm not knitting, well, I already told you that I'm in Texas, so obviously when I'm not knitting, I am super busy kissing babies and grandbabies. Last time we spoke, the day after I recorded, Peter and I jumped in the car, drove up, up to Denmark, where we had three busy but absolutely wonderful days before flying over here. 
We arrived here Wednesday last week in the evening. The next morning, Peter and our son, Alexander, they went back to the airport to fly out to California because Alexander was competing in the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championship, which is held in Long Beach, California. And I stayed uh, back here in Texas with my daughter-in-law and the little ones. And we made sure to have our own very special event. I do have a vlog um, from this weekend. Peter recorded some over in California. Marilia and I recorded some here in Texas. It's not the peaceful uh, nature vlog that I have been posting the last couple of times, but I don't know, maybe you will have some fun watching this one as well. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. It means the world. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button. That does help me a lot. And if you want, I am always thrilled by all your lovely comments. They make my heart all warm and fussy. And I, when I read through the comments, I always have a, a huge smile on my face. Thank you so, so much. I really love that we have this wonderful community surrounding this channel. I'm gonna end things and put on the vlog. I do hope to see you again the next time I record, which will be in two weeks. Until then, happy knitting. oldest son, Alexander, has been in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for many, many years. He's been a professional fighter and Peter and I have had some great times traveling the world to all kinds of Jiu-Jitsu events with him. However, back in 2000 15, he suffered a severe knee injury. He has had five knee surgeries. Also, he's had two children and a Jiu Jitsu Academy here in Texas. So the past couple of years, of course, his focus has been on building his family and developing his academy. But when he announced that he was gonna return to the mats for one final world championship, we were, of course, so excited. I decided to stay back in Texas with his family because bringing children to a Jiu Jitsu event is probably not the easiest thing to do. The places where the events are hosted are typically freezing cold and very, very noisy with lots of people. So Marilia, my daughter-in-law and I decided to stay in Texas and make our own little event out of watching the World Championship on television. Peter went to Long Beach, California with Alexander and I am gonna let him tell you about what happened that weekend. Today we're at Walter's Pyramid in Long Beach and it's a big day, a really big day. I've traveled to California with my oldest son Alexander and he's gonna fight the world championship today. We started here 13 years ago we were here the first time when he was a purple belt and uh, since then we had 10 
fantastic years going here twice a year for the Pan American Nationals and for the World Championship every year. So we have been here so many times, we just love it and we have butterflies in the stomach. Right. Now I'll go inside and uh, hopefully later we'll explain a little about the Jiu Jitsu, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that our son is uh, fighting. Now I'm inside the pyramid and uh, you can hear about 5,000 spectators and they are behind me here. Closer, but you probably won't hear me. Let's see if I can get it from here. There you go. This is the biggest event in the year for the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And there have been, I think, around 9,000 competitors. So it's a big, big event. We're so excited. So Alexander is going to fight in a couple of hours. He's starting to get ready to warm up. And I'm gonna show you the bullpen where they have the way in just a second. There you see the, the, the bullpen. That's where the fighters are waiting. They have to check their geese. They have to check their weight and so on. So, and they have butterflies in their stomach like me. Back in Texas, Marilia and I had our own private event with delicious food, lots of snacks, and, of course, lots of knitting. We were watching the event on the television together with the kids who had a great time watching Dad on the TV. That was so exciting. And Marilia and I were ecstatic as Alexander just blew through his division. He was fighting better than ever before. He looked strong, he looked confident, he looked happy. And it was all fun and good times until it wasn't anymore. But yeah, Saturday was exciting, a bit nerve-wracking at times, but overall amazing, and we were so happy. Now it's Sunday, and it's the day of the finals here at Walter Pyramids. And as you can see, the sky is gloomy. It's the June gloom that they always experience here. We have been here 10 years and almost every time we have experienced one or two or three days with the June gloom. So you're gonna have some nice days and then you can have this weather where this, all the clouds are hanging up there. And it is like especially here in June where the temperatures for the sea and the air and the mountains, they uh, kind of make this special environment where you have a lot of clouds here in, uh, here in Long Beach, California. Yesterday was a crazy day, it was crazy. Alexander, he had three fights and uh, in 2018 he had five operations in his knee due to injuries he had since 2012 I think the first injury came and then in 2015 it was really tough and then in 2018 he had all the ligaments in his knee was torn like absolutely torn not just like a little but it was torn up so um, he had a series of operation and he could barely walk for one and a half year and ever since he has been longing to go back to competition and uh, for three years now he has been living in Texas with his family and they have uh, they have built a beautiful academy I like the word beautiful <laughs> but, but uh, it's, it's a really nice academy with some wonderful <laughs> students and uh, this year he said I want to do it again Dad. he's 34 years old and I said well you can do it no, and of course you can do it and you're gonna win you're 
better than ever. The experience you have, your body is working, everything is perfect. So you can do it. And yesterday he started with the like elimination two and one, and he won three fights, and it was tough. It was tough. And in his the final seconds of the third the third fight, he uh, he he ripped his knee. And uh, fortunately, not the one he had the five surgeries in, but the other knee. And yesterday evening, it was okay. He felt okay. He said, Dad, I'm okay. But during the night, we woke up, I think it was 4.30, 5 o'clock this morning, and he could barely walk. But this boy is, he's not like the other ones in this family. He, uh, he just, he wanted so badly. So even though he can barely walk, he tries. He tries to the last second. And I said, if you're not like 85, 90%, in shape with everything then you're not gonna fight the championships but uh, he wants to fight he wants to fight the semi-final oh of course he wants to and he has a very very good chance but uh, again actually I hope he, he won't do it because his knee is really bad okay now I'll go in and see the finals for today for the black belts and see my my boy on the podium even though he's not fighting the semifinals, he still has a bronze medal at the World Championships. And I'm so proud of him. Let's go inside. And now we're inside and uh, Alexander is trying to prepare. He went to do some warm-up to see if it is okay. But, yeah, let's see. Let's see. As I said, I hope he doesn't do it. Let me show you the all this pyramid. It's a really nice event. It's still early in the morning and as you can see now there's only two mats for the finals, the black belt finals. Okay, let's see. Alexander was assessed by a physician who diagnosed a grade 2 tear on his ligament. Even though he was not able to fight, he still earned his bronze medal and we're gonna stay for the ceremony. Alexander started training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in 2004 at the age of 15. In 2010, he started competing internationally, winning the European and World Championship as a purple belt and began traveling to Brazil to train with high-level instructors and training partners. After winning all of the major tournaments, including the World Championship as a brown belt, he was awarded his black belt in 2011 and is currently a third degree black belt. Since achieving his black belt, he continued competing at the highest level, conquering some of the most important titles of the sport. As a black belt, he's a two-time silver medalist and a three-time bronze, no, sorry. Now he's a four-time bronze medalist at the World Championship. In third place, representing GFT International, Alexander Tran. Thank you. 